Hello, my name is Umar Awan, and I'm an associate professor of musculoskeletal radiology here at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Today, I'd like to discuss my approach to evaluating the an MR examination of the shoulder. And feel free to take whatever pearls you want from this. As I'm sure you guys know, there are multiple ways to evaluate uh, an MRI examination of the shoulder, but these are just some of the pearls that I think are helpful for junior residents and even senior residents when evaluating the shoulder. So I'd like to start by looking at the coronal T2 fat set and the sagittal T2 fat set together simultaneously, one on each monitor, because when you evaluate the rotator cuff, it's very important to talk about the thickness and the width of a tendon tear. The thickness of the tendon is demonstrated by the craniocaudad length of the tendon. So for example, here on the coronal image, the thickness of this tendon, which is this dark hypoatendin structure right here, courses from the articular surface of the humeral head all the way to the bursal surface right here where my arrow is just under the acromion. That's the thickness of the tendon, this craniocaudad length. The width of the tendon is seen more on the sagittal uh, images and the width is the AP dimension of the tendon. So for example, this right here where my arrow is is a supraspinatus muscle and this dark hypointense structure is the tendon and as we come down towards the greater tuberosity where it inserts, the width of the tendon is this whole anterior to posterior dimension of the tendon. So that's the width. So that's whenever we talk about tears, we talk about the thickness and the width of the tendons. So the first thing I do when I evaluate a uh, MRI examination of the shoulders, I look to see if there's any subacromial cell deltoid bursal fluid. So on this image, you would see, on the coronal image, you would see T2 bright signal under the acromion um, within the potential space called the subacromial cell deltoid bursa. Now this is not really subacromial cell deltoid bursal fluid. This is actually just a peribursal fat, which is also bright on this T2 fat sat weighted image. If we had more pronounced fluid, we would actually see really bright T2 hyperintense fluid to suggest subacromial cell deltoid bursal fluid. And it's a good clue to suggest the possibility of subacromial impingement or rotator cuff pathology if you see that subacromial cell deltoid bursal fluid. So that's why that's the first thing I look at. Then I look at the four tendons of the rotator cuff, which are the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, the teres minor, and the subscapularis. And again, just for review, the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor insert onto the greater tuberosity of the humerus, and the subscapularis inserts onto the lesser tuberosity of the humerus. And first, I'll start with the supraspinatus. The supraspinatus is anterior. This is the muscle belly of the supraspinatus right here on the coronal image. And the myotendinous junction is sort of right here where you're starting to see black hypointense tendon. And then this is the rest of the tendon right here, which is dark and hypointense. And as we course through the tendon, it's inserting right here onto the greater tuberosity. Notice that we, there's no fluid signal intensity within this tendon to suggest any uh, tendon tear. So the whole course of the tendon is nice and dark. And the anterior leading edge fibers are essentially right here. If you, the, it's a slice right after you see the long head of the biceps tendon. So this here is the long head of the biceps where my arrow is. The long head of the biceps tendon kind of courses inferiorly, then it courses superiorly, and it's going to make a turn and insert onto the supraglenoid tubercle of the glenoid where the labrum is. That's all the biceps tendon. And right after that cut, you're going to see the supraspinatus tendon. And that's what it is here. So there's certainly no full thickness tear or even a partial thickness tear. And we want to corroborate that on the sagittal view. So we come here to the sagittal. This is the sagittal view. And you can actually see all the muscles of the rotator cuff. This is a supraspinatus. This here is a subscapularis because it's right next to the lung. It's anterior. These are the ribs. And then back here is the infraspinatus. And this is a teres minor ten muscle and tendon. So those are the four muscles of the rotator cuff. And if you take a look at the muscle here in the tendon, the tendon is this dark hypointense band, and as we come towards its insertion, you're going to see the entire anterior posterior length of the tendon from here anteriorly to here posteriorly, okay? That is the supraspinatus tendon. The infraspinatus, which also inserts onto the greater tuberosity, is seen more posteriorly. It's this tendon right here. It's, this is the muscle. This is the myotendinous junction where my arrow is, and these black this black hypointense structure is the tendon, and it's inserting right here onto the greater tuberosity. So it's inserting right here, and you can take a look, and it's somewhat thick, and there's some intermediate signal within it. So maybe there's some mild tendinosis of the tendon, but there's certainly no tear of this tendon, okay? And we can corroborate that on the sagittal view 
this is the muscle here this hypo intense structure is the is the uh tendon and it's also going to insert right here onto the greater tuberosity again no fluid signal to, su to suggest a tear okay and then we're going to look at the teres minor tendon which is right on the coronal view it's right under the infraspinatus so this is the infraspinatus right here and the teres minor is right here also inserting onto the uh inferior facet of the greater tuberosity okay it looks normal teres minor is is very rarely involved in tendon pathology and this is the muscle here and the tendon and if we take a look here, it's actually hard to see. It's right there. It's this dark, hypointense structure. And this will also insert right here onto the greater tuberosity, OK? So the teres minor is intact. And the subscapularis is this muscle right here on the sagittal view. And then the tendon is this dark, hypointense structure. And it's going to insert right here onto the lesser tuberosity of the humerus. And that also looks normal. But the gold standard to evaluate the subscapularis is really the axial view because you can see the whole length of the tendon very well on the axial view you can see it on the coronal as well if you come anteriorly these fibers right here are the subscapularis muscle and tendon inserting here onto the lesser tuberosity but you really want to come to the axial view and the and the subscapularis is always located anterior to the glenoid so this is the glenoid process of the scapula this is the muscle this is the tendon this hypotense structure right here and you're going to follow it all the way to the lesser tuberosity which is right there okay and it looks pretty normal Okay, so that's the lesser tuberosity. So, so that is the rotator. This patient has no rotator cuff tear, just mild tendinosis of the infraspinatus tendon. The next structure I like to evaluate is the biceps tendon and the intraarticular portion of the biceps tendon. So the biceps tendon sits right here in the bicipital groove. It's this ovoid dark structure right here. It sits between the lesser tuberosity, which is right where my arrow is, and the greater tuberosity right here on this axial view. Notice that you can have some fluid around the biceps tendon sheath, and that's normal because the biceps tendon sheath are, uh, is in direct communication with the glenohumeral joint space. So if there's fluid in the glenohumeral joint, you better be aware that there will likely be fluid around the biceps tendon sheath as well. So this is the biceps tendon. Because there's really not a lot of fluid in the glenohumeral joint, maybe there's some mild tenosynovitis involving the long end of the biceps tendon. Um, but certainly there's no tear here. And then you want to trace the biceps tendon all the way to the supraglenoid tubercle where the labrum is inserting because that forms a biceps labral anchor. So this curvy linear hypotenuse structure is a biceps labral anchor and it inserts right here onto superglenoid tubercle along the superior labrum. So this structure right here I'm outlining is the biceps labral anchor that's inserting right here onto the superglenoid tubercle. Okay, and that's intact as well. Okay, and you can look at that on the sagittal view as well. If you come here, this structure right here where my arrow is is the biceps tendon and it's going to come actually i'm sorry that's a supraspinatus the biceps tendon is a little harder to see it's sort of this structure right here and it's going to come right here and insert onto the 12 o'clock position along the supraglenoid tubercle of the labrum right here okay so that's the biceps tendon right there you can also see it on the coronal view which i showed earlier it's a little harder to see here but you have some fluid surrounding its tendon sheath, which is why we can see it right here, and it, it's going to come and come come across the intertubercular sulcus of the humerus and insert right here onto the supraglenoid tubercle right there, okay? So that's the biceps tendon. We talked about the biceps labral anchor, and then the next thing I want to evaluate is the labrum. The labrum is a fibrocartilagin structure, okay, that helps, uh, you know, cushion the joint. Um, it's there's a superior labrum, there's an inferior labrum. It's a 360 degree structure. You can see that on the sagittal view. It sort of goes all the way circumferentially around the glenoid, okay? And we look for labral tears, to see if there's any increased signal within that labrum, okay? You can look at it on the sagittal view, although this is not an orthogram, so we can't see it, you know, 100% well because it's the, the joint is not fully distended. And you can see the labrum here as well. It's this triangular hypotense structure here superiorly. It's this triangular structure here inferiorly as well that's essentially the labrum but it's best seen on the axial view so i'm going to come back here to the axial view we're going to start superiorly and work our way inferiorly this is the biceps labral anchor again and then this here is the anterior labrum this is the posterior labrum and as we cut down there should be no signal going into the labrum either anteriorly or posteriorly again anterior labrum posterior labrum i didn't see any fluid signal to suggest a displaced labral tear on this non-arthrographic study. Obviously, an arthrogram will be much more sensitive to evaluate for labral tears. At the anterior superior quadrant, or at the 12 to 3 o'clock position of the labrum, kind of in this location here on the sagittal, between the 12 o'clock and 3 o'clock position right here, 
there's a lot of labral variants like a perilabral recess or sublabral foramen that can exist not to be confused with labral tearing. So you, if you ever see signal in that quadrant of the labrum, you always want to be careful and make sure you're not overcalling a labral tear. Okay, so that covers the rotator cuff tendons, the biceps, the biceps labral anchor, and the labrum. Now I turn and I assess the osseous structures. And I start by looking at the acromioclavicular joint. And I like to look at the coronals to, to see what the morphology of the acromioclavicular joint is and the morphology of the acromion. Here I notice already that there is some capsular hypertrophy here. The capsule of the AC joint is a little hypertrophied. There is some minimal inferior spurring that can result in subacromial impingement because that narrows the acromiohumeral interval here. Okay, I want to assess to see if there's any subchondral marrow edema, subchondral cystic change. In this patient, the patient does not have any. Um, I also want to see if there's an osochromiali, if there's an accessory ossification center of the acromion, because that can be associated with rotator cuff pathology. And the best view to look at that is the axial view. <clears throat> and lo and behold, this person actually does have an osochromiali. There's an accessory ossification center in there um, with, with the acromion separated into two distinct bone fragments. So this is an osochromiali. This can be associated with rotator cuff pathology. Okay. Then I like to look at the glenohumeral joint. I want to look to see if there's any marrow contusion, fracture, any stigmata of degenerative joint disease by subchondral marrow edema, subchondral cystic change. I want to carefully look at the cartilage, which is this gray intermediate signal to see if there's any focal chondral defects, if there's any fluid signal intensity within this. I'll see if there's a chondral defect. There's no chondral defects on this glenohumeral joint. You can assess to see if there's an effusion. There is some trace fluid here, but not quite enough to call a joint effusion. Okay. So we want to look at the entire uh, osseous structures to see to evaluate them fully. You want to look at the glenoid process of the scapula. You want to look at the coracoid process of the scapula, scapular body, the rest of the humerus. Again, you want to also take a look at the ribs to make sure that there's no fractures or marrow edema about the ribs as well. Okay, And you can look at this on the coronal view to see if there's no marrow edema, which we don't see. And then you always want to look at a T1 weighted image to assess the marrow because you want to look for marrow proliferative and marrow replacing processes which will appear iso intense to dark <clears throat> on T1 relative to the muscle and here the marrow is nice and bright indicating that it's nice and fatty okay there may be some red marrow reconversion here because this signal is uh, brighter than the underlying muscle so that's okay okay it's not uh, suggestive of a marrow replacing process Okay, you can also look at the morphology of the acromion here on the sagittal view here. And that's essentially how I look at the osseous structures. And then finally, we're actually almost done looking at the shoulder. There's a couple other things that I want to point your attention to. You should always assess to see if there's any <coughs> excuse me, axillary lymphadenopathy. And you can look at that on the axial view to see if there's any pathologically enlarged axillary nodes that can be a sign for metastatic disease. I don't see any axillary lymph. There are some axillary nodes here, none of which that are pathologically enlarged. You want to look to see if there's any masses within the suprascapular or spinoglenoid notch. The suprascapular spinoglenoid notch uh, house the suprascapular nerve. Okay, that innervates the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscles. The suprascapular notch is along the superior border of the scapula. It's right here. You can see the suprascapular nerve bundles coursing right here along the suprascapular notch. And as you go more posteriorly, this is a spinoglenoid notch right here along the posterior scapular blade and neck junction. Okay, there's no masses here in the suprascapular spinoclinoid notches. If you look at the sagittal view, you can also see that as well. The suprascapular notch is right here along the superior border of the scapula. Right here, you can see the suprascapular neurovascular bundle. And then as you go more posteriorly, this is a spinoglenoid notch right here along the scapular blade neck junction. These are the suprascapular neurovascular bundle here. If you have a mass here along the suprascapular notch, that can result in denervation, atrophy of the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscle. However, if you have a mass at the spinoglenoid notch, that's only going to result in denervation of the infraspinatus because the nerve has already passed where it innervates the supraspinatus muscle. Okay. There's also another potential space that I want to bring to your attention. That's the quadrilateral space. And that's the space here, that right here, that holds the axillary nerve as well as the posterior circumflex humeral artery and vein. And that's bordered by four distinct structures, which is the teres minor muscle right here, teres major muscle right here, the humerus and then the triceps muscle right here okay so those are the border that though that's what makes the border of the quadrilateral space there can be masses and lesions that 
impinge the axillary nerve here in the quadrilateral space. That'll obviously result in atrophy or denervation of the deltoid and teres minor muscles because those are the muscles that are innervated by the axillary nerve. Okay, so we've assessed that. And the last thing, or one of the last things I like to look at is the sagittal T1 weighted image which I'll bring right here to look for a muscular atrophy. So you can see here that the rotator cuff musculature, the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis all have nice muscular bulk. There's no T1 hyperintense signal to suggest fatty atrophy, and the bulk of the muscle is preserved. Typically, if you come here along a sequence and you draw a line between the tips of the, scap of, of the scapula, if you have supraspinatus muscle going over that line, then there's the muscular bulk is essentially preserved. Okay, so the muscular bulk here is preserved. And also, I want to bring your attention finally to the last thing I want to talk about, which is a rotator interval. It's the space here between the supraspinatus and subscapularis where the coracohumeral ligament, the superior glenohumeral ligament, and the biceps tendon run through. There should be nice fat within this rotator interval as there is in this case. If you have replacement of that fat, that can suggest adhesive capsulitis in the appropriate clinical setting. Obviously, adhesive capsulitis is a clinical diagnosis, but we can suggest that based on replacement of the fat within this rotator interval. So that's sort of my uh, evaluation approach to evaluating MRI examination of the shoulder. I hope that this has been somewhat helpful to all of you when you guys are dictating studies in the reading room. Thank you so much for your attention.